Starting a new series, I am going to be doing chapter summaries from this textbook, Madron Interactions, Shabai and Sherwood. Uh, great, great introductory physics book. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to give chapter summaries. So, I mean, you probably should still read the book. Uh, maybe I'll miss some of the things, but the key things, I'm going to get the key things in here. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Let me go ahead and say something about the book because the book's awesome. This kind of takes a new approach at uh, introductory physics starting from scratch. A lot of the other textbooks are kind of, I think, all the same. This starts from a more fundamental aspect of looking at the fundamental forces and the interactions uh, with these fundamental interactions and the nature of matter. That's why it's called matter and interactions. Uh, in, I'm starting the second semester, so we're starting with electric field. We're going to look at electric, the, ma the main, if you think about the main arc in the second semester, is to go through uh, electric and magnetic fields and matter, ending with Maxwell's equations, and that's where we're going to get to. So chapter 13 is titled electric field. Let's just start with some fundamental things. We have uh, two types of charges, positive and negative. I mean, that, that's not super surprising. And when we talk about fundamental charges, at least this level, we can say those two types of charges consist of the proton and the electron. And this has a charge, we'll represent charge Q as plus E, and this QP, the charge of an electron, QE, is minus E, where E is a fundamental constant. It has a value of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And coulombs is a unit we use for charge. There are, it does get weird. There's some other stuff going on with charges, but this is where we're going to be at here. We, these are our fundamental charges, the, the positive charge and the negative charge. Okay. And then you have seen things like like charges repel, unlike charges attract, and we can get an expression for the interaction between two charges. Suppose I have a plus charge Q1 and I have a minus charge Q2 and they're separated by distance R. Then the force attracting them, and again, this is going to be, force comes in pairs. This is going to be F1 uh, on 2 and this is F2 two on one, they're the same, Newton's third law, we can find the magnitude of that force as one over four pi, epsilon naught, Q1, Q2, magnitude over the magnitude of R squared. And that gives me the magnitude of the force. We'll get a vector version of it later. So, because it doesn't make sense to talk about these as positive and negative because we haven't given a direction here. And the same thing for this. The R, the, the vector from one charge to the other, it, the location is a vector too, so you got to take the magnitude before you square it. But we'll deal with that when we talk about the electric field. The important thing here is this constant. That's a constant, a fundamental constant. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is equal to 9, 9, times 10 to the 9th newton meter squared per coulomb squared. So that's kind of a big deal. That's kind of a big deal. That's kind of a big deal. So that's the electric force, the coulomb force between two charges. Now we need to talk about the field, electric field. Let me just switch back to second, uh, just because hopefully this is the second semester of physics, so maybe you took the first semester. Uh, and suppose that I have a ball right here with a mass m, and you're thinking, what the heck are you doing? Uh, well, that ball would have a, and let's say the mass is one kilogram. Then I can calculate the gravitational force on the surface, near the surface of the Earth, Fg as mg, where g is equal to zero, negative 9.8, zero newtons per coulomb, kilogram, sorry, newtons per kilogram. Uh, that's that value of g. Some people call that the acceleration due to gravity. I don't like that because if you put a block right there, it's not accelerating. I like to call this the gravitational field. Now, I missed my thing there. Notice that it has a negative y component. Okay, but if I take the magnitude of g, if I just write g, it's 
that's the, that's the magnitude of it, newtons per kilogram. Okay, so what would the force, the magnitude of this force here, F, the magnitude, I'll write it like this, would be equal to the mass, one kilogram, times G, 9.8 newtons per kilogram, equals 9.8 newtons. Yay! Not a big deal. Now, what if I replace that with 10, a mass of 10 kilograms? Well, in that case, the, the force would be 10 kilograms times 9.8 newtons per kilogram equals 98 newtons. So really, this is the force per unit mass. Force per mass. And that's what the field is. It's a way for us to describe the effect of the Earth independent of what we put there. We put something different there, you get a different force. And that's the idea of a field. This is a vector field uh, because every location has a, has a value. It could be the same, it could be different, and it's a vector at every point. Okay, so it's a vector field. Vector field. I'm always afraid I'm going to misspell field for some reason, because especially when you're working in a video. Now we can do the same thing with electric charge. Suppose that I have uh, a charge right there, Q1, and a charge over here, Q2. I can calculate the force on that, F1 on 2, and I'll write it as a vector, and you know whatever we could use Coulomb's law. But I could also find, the, if I replace this with another charge, it's going to also experience a force. So we can write F1 on 2 as the charge Q2 times the electric field of, let's just call that E1. The electric field due to charge 1 at that location, I multiply it by the charge and I get a force. So this is the force per unit charge. And I think this was kind of confusing to me as an, as an undergraduate because it, it felt like, oh, they'd always say put a test charge there and calculate the force on it and then divide by the charge. And then it's like, well, why are you putting the charge there if you're just dividing by the charge? And the reason is because we can measure force. You can't really, it's really hard to measure electric field. There are ways to do that. Uh, but we measure force. Uh, and so then you, if you know the charge, you can find the electric field. But this is the electric field due to a point charge, this point charge. Okay. You cannot have a charge create an electric field and exert a force on itself. That would be like trying to pick yourself up with your boots uh, by pulling on your boots, and that's just not possible. So let's write the electric field due to a point charge. I'm going I'm to write the most general version of this. So imagine that I have uh, some, or some axis and an origin right there, and I have a charge, let's call that uh, Q, Q1 right there. And I want to find the electric field at some other location. I'm going to call that uh, uh, the vector from the origin R O for observation location. That's where we want to find the electric field. And this will be the vector R, I'll call it R1, right? That's the vector location of the charge Q1. I need to find this vector R. And since I, we've done this before, and you, you did this in mechanics, right? If an object moved from one to two, then the displacement would be this position minus that. And the same thing's true here, even though it's not in time, such that R is equal to RO minus R1. That's that vector from here to there, okay? Now I can use that to calculate the electric field in this case, which would be pointing that way, E1. E1, it's, it's like the force of charge in there, but I'm going to divide by that charge. So I have the 1 over 4 pi, epsilon naught, Q1. Now I have to divide by the magnet. You can't divide by a vector, right? No matter what other people say, they're wrong. Uh, so I need to find the magnitude of that vector, uh, the magnitude of R, and then square it. And this is a vector. That's a scalar, scalar, scalar. So I need to also multiply this by r hat. r hat is the unit vector in the direction of r. So just recall, r hat is equal to the vector r divided by the magnitude of the vector r. And it gives me a vector, and the magnitude of that vector is 1. And it has no units because the units here cancel. So that we have to have that unit vector in there. Otherwise, you're not going to get this as a vector field. And we need it as a vector field. Very important to have that as a vector field. 
And so that's the most generic version, right? Because you don't have to put the charge at the origin and that can be anywhere too. So you can move these anywhere you want and you can use the same method to find the electric field due to a single point charge. Now, what would that look like? If I look at, uh, and it's better to do this visually, which I will do at some point, I have a video on this. If you want to do this visually, a, point, a positive point charge would have an electric field that points away from the point charge. So it'd look like something like this. I'm going to draw it in groups. So I'm representing this as the electric field vector. I'm not going to draw anything. And then it's pointing away in three dimensions, but it's kind of hard to draw something in three dimensions on two-dimensional paper. And then as you get further away, the magnitude decreases, but it still points away. And that's the electric field due to a single point charge. If I have a negative charge, well, then we just get the opposite, right? So now the since I have a negative charge here, R hat points away, but I'm multiplying it by a negative sign, which flips the direction. So here's my electric field due to a negative point charge. These are all the same length. And then as you get further away, it's smaller. And again, it's much easier to visualize this with Python, which we will do. So that's the electric field due to a positive point charge. That's the electric field due to a negative point charge. But what if I have two point charges? This is one of the really big things. We call this the superposition principle. Position, okay. So imagine that I have two charges. I'll say a plus charge right there, Q1, and another plus charge right here, Q2, and I want to find the electric field at this point. The electric field at this point is the electric field due to Q1 in, by itself, and the electric field due to Q2 by itself, and then you add them together. So the electric field, let's just visualize what that would look like. If the charge Q1 would make an electric field going this way, and we'll call that E1, charge Q2 would make an electric field a little bit smaller because it's further away, we'll call that E2, and then E would be equal to E1 plus E2. And that would be something like this. Well, it won't be quite that way. It will be maybe like this, E. So that's the superposition principle. It says that if I have more than one charge, the electric field is the sum of the individual electric fields. And I can do it for two, I could do it for four, I could do it for 10 to the 22 if I really wanted to, okay? This is gonna be a big deal. We're gonna do some more problems with superposition. Uh, but in this chapter, we're really gonna look at uh, one case of just using two different charges, and that's the dipole. Now, there is one other thing they talk about in the book that it just turns out to be practically useful. Uh, and we will derive this later. Imagine that I have a sphere and I have a positive charge uniformly uh, spread over the surface of this sphere. If that's the case, then the electric field at some point over here, uh, distance r away, would look like all of that charge is concentrated at the center. So this looks like, looks like, a point charge, even though it's not. And that has to be spherically distributed, right? Uniformly distributed. It can't just be a sphere. Uh, so if there's more charge on one side than the other, then it doesn't count. It doesn't actually have to be on the surface. It doesn't really matter as long as it's uniformly spherical distributed. It could be all the way through there. It doesn't really matter as long as you're outside the sphere. What if you're inside the sphere? Well, we'll deal with that later, okay? One more thing. This is the what we call a dipole. So suppose I have a charge right here, um, a negative charge, and then I have a charge right there, a positive charge, and they're separated by a distance s. This is what's called a dipole. So it has equal and opposite charges. They have to be equal and opposite, separated by a distance s. Well, what would this electric field look like? I could just use the superposition principle and find the electric field at any point, right? So here, this is going to be pointing away like that. Here, it's going to be pointing towards, but not as great. And so we get an E field like that. 
and then we could do it at any number of locations um, and in general it looks something like this I'm just gonna sketch because you've seen this before and I'm gonna draw it as lines it looks like this these are these are not vector fields these are vector lines just way easier to draw and if you know you looked at the magnetic field due to a bar magnet uh, that's the same shape okay because that's a dipole field but you can calculate the location the vector the electric field at any location just using superposition principle however there are two uh, vector fields that we can calculate and get an approximate value for so one is along the axis of this dipole so if I'm over here at some point, I'm going to have the electric field due to the positive charge. I'll call that E plus. I have the electric field due to the negative charge, E minus. And they do not cancel because the minus charge is further away, so it has a smaller field. And the net field is pointing away. And let's call this the distance R. And that's S. I'm not going to derive this. It's not terribly difficult. But if you make some approximations about R being much greater than S, then I can get what we call the... Uh, the magnitude electric field on the axis E axis and it's equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught 2 q s over r cubed and that's just the magnitude this is technically called the far field approximation it's got two p's prox let's do it like that okay now, I could also do the same thing moving along this axis. So up here, I'm going to have the electric field down that way and that way. And they're the same magnitude, and they're going to exactly uh, cancel in the y direction. You get a net field that way. And this would be E perpendicular, so perpendicular to the axis. And it's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught qs over r cubed. Notice up here, this is a really important point, it has the same units as electric field due to a point charge. We have that constant, we have q over r squared, right? So we have meters over meters cubed, it does give me one over meters squared, so that's good. And same thing over here. The only difference is we don't have the two. And these are only true for the far field approximation, so as long as r is greater than s. And so how great does that have to be? Well, it depends on how good you want your approximation to be. Now, there's one other way to write this. We can call uh, a dipole moment. And we will write that as P equals to QS. So this tells us something about the dipole, right? I need to know the magnitude of the charge. The net charge is zero, but we're talking about just on one side. And the separation between them, and the product of those is called the dipole moment. And then in that case, this becomes E axis is oh you missed that i mean okay e axis is one over four pi epsilon naught two p over r cubed right so we just replace the qs with p and it's just one way to deal with describing what that dipole is okay that was chapter 13. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't say this at the beginning, I'm just going over the concepts. I'm not working problems. I'll do problems separately. Uh, but that is the chapter 13 from Matter and Interactions chapter summary. Still read the book. The book is awesome. My favorite book ever. The end. Oh, I'll put a list, uh, a playlist, and I'll put the link down below if you want to see the rest of the chapter summaries as I make them. The end.